Thank you very much for attending the presentation after a very informative day. Uh, this image, the next one here, is the teaser for what we are about to present. This project began when I was a child, and I started to collect old books. Um, and I started with the British Chatterbox Annuals, uh, which were designed for children. The late Hugh Wade, who was the proprietor of the Haunted Bookshop in Victoria, BC, known in my family as the Haunted BS, was, uh, encouraged my collection because he knew that I read the annuals and I wasn't just buying the books to make uh, a nice-looking bookshelf, that I was truly interested in the articles. So I used my allowance money to buy the books uh, and started my collection. By the time I was a teenager, um, I was uh, introduced to the girls' own annuals by Hugh Wade, and he referred to me as his youngest old customer or his oldest young customer. He, um, and he introduced me to these girls' owns, and I was hooked. Fifty years later, I am still hooked. I loved the books and kept collecting them. The collection now numbers 70 volumes, and I brought one of them with me today, which I will have with me throughout uh, the next several hours, so if you want to take a look, you're more than welcome. Air Canada hates me, and none of my friends will ever help me move because each book weighs several pounds. Um, the inexpensive versions of these books were bound once a year with a cloth binding, and they were not terribly attractive, but the bound versions are actually beautiful, and... Uh, they're embossed, stamped, uh, and uh, really lovely to look at. So I'm uh, very proud to have many of them in my collection. So, the books were uh, sent to young women in Commonwealth countries all over the world, uh, and once they were bound, they were highly prized as Christmas gifts. A Canadian distributor, ironically, was located here in Montreal. Uh, the Girls' Own Annual was originally targeted towards young women in their late teens or early 20s. Um, by the time it ceased publication after World War II, the demographic was skewed towards a much younger audience. The articles covered cookery, fashion, health and fitness, home decor, uh, the arts, royalty and contests. There was also the ever-popular answers to correspondence area, where people would write in as if it was to Dear Abby, and they would receive answers from the editors. The only problem was, in the books, they never published the questions, so all you get is the answers. So it leaves it to your imagination what the, uh, the original question is. If you were to, pr to produce these today, you would be looking at a combination of hello, good housekeeping, and cosmopolitan magazines, and remove the sex, and you'd probably have the girls' own annual. The genesis, genesis of this project occur, occurred a few years ago when I took one into my typography lecture to show the class how much and how little typo, typography has changed in the past century. As I was doing this, I noticed that the typographic ornaments in the annuals were truly beautiful and merited a research project. The Girls' Own Annual was first published in 1880, one year after the Boys' Own Annual, which started in, in 1879. Over this, the past uh, century and a bit, the Boys' Own has been much more popular and well-known than the Girls' Own. Um, during the first year of the Boys' Own, uh, young women entered the contests that were published in each edition, and they started winning them. So the uh, publishers decided that the girls merited their own, uh, their own annual. Uh, it, it actually started as a weekly and then a monthly and then bound annually. So they merited their own, and uh, they started one, and shortly after publication commenced, they were producing 250,000 copies of every monthly. 250,000 copies in 1880, I think that's just amazing. The early editions were published by the Religious Tract Society and printed by William Clowes and Company, uh, who had numerous printing works in London and across the UK. That printing company was founded in 1803 by William Clowes and was operated for six generations until they were acquired by a French conglomerate in the 1990s. 
One source I reviewed hinted that Charles Dickens worked in the press area blackening the type before uh, various publications were printed. And this image is of the printing works on Duke Street prior to World War II. This project never, almost never got off the ground because as I began to do research, I discovered that the Religious Tract Society is now known as Lutterworth Press. So it actually has evolved over time and been in operation for many years. I wrote to them to ask if there was any material uh, relating, remaining related to uh, the publication of the Girls' Own or Boys' Own Annuals, and I was devastated to learn that uh, the printing works had been bombed during World War II, and basically nothing remained. So I continued on my way with cataloging what I have. Oh, let me just go back. Go ahead. So I opened up my first Girls' Own Annual publication, <laughs> In September 2016, when I began working with Jillian, the book was very fragile and had to be handled with care, but it didn't take away from the intricate design of the cover as well as the content inside. It was then that I began to, the task of cataloging the draw caps in the annual. After turning nearly 16,000 pages from nearly 20 volumes, I cataloged a total of almost 2,500 draw caps. Once a volume was cataloged, I began the process of photographing it. My setup consisted of a Nikon D90 camera with a Sigma 105mm macro lens that was mounted to a vertical stand, and this way I could control the camera from my laptop with a tethered shooting option that automatically sent the photos to Adobe Lightroom where I did most of my editing. Uh, this proved to be very helpful because for the first few volumes I was actually standing up manually shooting, and as soon as I get a little stiff, stiff in my neck, I uh, decided to commit to the tethered shooting method entirely. Um, once the drop caps in the particular volume were captured, I adjusted for white balance and brightness with a batch applied to all of the images. This helped bring the photos to life from the yellowish tinted paper inside of the century old volumes. After this step was complete, I exported them to a folder on my desktop and began renaming them according to character, page number, and volume number. I split the computer screen to do this, one half containing the cataloged info on Google Sheets and the second half actually being the photo. This proved to be useful when analyzing the photos and comparing them to later or earlier years, as well as comparing them to a small number of images from the Boys' Own Annual. After analyzing many photos, I sorted them into folders of the corresponding individual letters. Jillian and I began to pick our favorites, and there were many. We also started to compare and contrast similarities and differences in the drop caps based on year, artist signatures, and decorative ornaments. And now for the fun part. I wish we could show you all 2,500 images that we have digitized, but we've edited the collection for those we hope will bring you joy and inspiration. In the course of discovering and cataloging the ornaments, we made several findings of note. And the first is that there seems to be a, a bit of a creative divide between the illustrative ornaments and the typographic ones. Some ornaments are strikingly similar to ornamented typefaces released in, er in the early 1900s. Partway through the project, Aaron sent me a very excited email to say that he had discovered breadcrumbs in the ornaments. So when looking through many images of drop caps, you start to begin to notice trends. I noticed a trend of artist signatures actually embedded in the letters themselves. And I got lucky and I found the full name of an artist accompanied by his unique logo-esque signature. This artist's name was Alan Wright. I then cross-referenced his name to a few sources recommended by our colleague Stephen Sword at the Massey College Printing Library in the University of Toronto. And in these sources, I was actually able to find Alan's name, a short bio, and the methods he used as an artist. Finding this information, along with other information on, on, on other artists, helped us confirm that a lot of these letters were actually made as woodcuts in conjunction with electrotyping. For a comparison, we looked at uh, one edition of the Boys' Own Annual from the same time frame. It was clear that the ornaments were used there too. However, their designs appear to be more related to the themes of the Boys' Own Annual articles, and there were more mas they were more masculine in nature. Tigers figure prominently in the early editions of the Boys' Own. In a future project, I hope to determine if any of the same uh, ornaments were used in both sets of annuals. We have not looked at enough of them yet to, uh, to absolutely say that this is the case. We also found that there's no complete typeface in which all of the letters were used in any style. 
The most popular ornaments were the letters T, M, S, W, I, and A. The letters Q, X, and Z didn't appear at all, not surprisingly. Although we isolated most of the letters to digitize them, we photographed some of them in place to see how they were treated alongside the accompanying text. Many of the letters we found were used in different editions across the 25 years of our survey. By 1905, and earlier for the boys' own, the ornamental uh, caps started to disappear. A great deal of this had to do with a change in the editorship. Until about 1900, the girls' own annual was edited by a man. Ill health had forced him to retire, and I believe he passed away not long after that. And the editorship went to the formidable Flora Clickman. Um, and she faced considerable pressure from the publishers uh, regarding finances, uh, as well as a changing culture and changing technologies related to the printing industry. In the GOAs, birds and flowers were very prominent within the ornaments, frequently being related to the accompanying article. We found it very interesting that all the typefaces uh, used uh, were uniformly serifed. So this would be for the text in, in the annuals themselves. The ornaments were almost always not. Sometimes the theme of the drop caps were completely random and there was no specific style. And sometimes the ornamental drop cap was actually a whole word. For example, the word the. And now I'm going to interject some Canadian content that has nothing to do with the presentation. Well, somewhat. One of the interesting things about the girls' own annual was that the Canadian author, Lucy Maud Montgomery, published several articles in the, in the girls' own annuals over the years, but she did not publish under her own name. She wrote under a pseudonym. Uh, one of the other articles I've discovered uh, was written by Alexander Graham Bell which seems really uh, a long shot to be writing uh, something for the girls' own annual. But his piece, which is one page long, on uh, the advantages of wind power uh, was a classic when it was written, and it is still a classic now. So we really just developed a great admiration for the artists that created these ornaments. We hope that our research inspires you to head for a local library to find out, uh, to find out of print volumes of uh, various publications. But this will come with a warning. Uh, many of the, uh, these books have actually been uh, put on microfiche in order to include them in library catalogs, which is a great idea. But uh, one of the problems that we ran into with the microfiche editions, which we looked at very few because I had my own collection of the girls' owns, but the microfiche editions are a very poor quality. Uh, so whoever was doing the ca image capturing um, was not really capturing the true beauty of these images. One of our favorite discussions throughout the project has surrounded favorites. This was not one of them. <laughs> However, this was our favorite. We really just think the W makes, or the birds make the W look really great. Yes, we love this. So as we get to the conclusion of the presentation, you might be thinking to yourself, so what's next? Well, um, this is an example of one of the puzzle contest uh, pages that we found. Uh, we looked at, this is known as a puzzle poem, and it's left for the reader to interpret what it really says. Uh, we looked at this puzzle. We couldn't solve it, even after we had the answers from the following month's edition of the Girls' Own Paper. So I am looking, I'm serious about this, I'm looking for a research collaborator, uh, perhaps someone who truly loves emojis, um, to explore this a bit further because I think there's a great project here. We also identified uh, eight additional projects coming out of this original one, um, and that's good fortune for a researcher. 
I've taken on a personal challenge to try and develop some lino cuts from some of the initials. Um, and this is uh, a challenge for me because I have never done this before. Um, and I will be looking for a research assistant to assist with cataloging the boys' own annuals uh, starting in 2018. Aaron and I would not have been able to make uh, this presentation work without the wonderful responses to the project that we have received, and we are very, very grateful. People have been eager to help, offer suggestions and advice. We will present more technical aspects of the work next week at the Book History and Digital Humanities Conference at the University of Wisconsin. The project has been booked for two displays at Ryerson University this fall, and I plan to complete my collection of girls' own annuals shortly. Erin will be graduating, entering the workforce, and looking forward to possibly uh, uh, entering a master's degree. Thank you. Yeah, thank you guys. Thank you.